the title of the exhibit has at least two meanings. The first draws on the contemporary and historical imperative to signal a nation's distinctiveness in an era of increased globalization. Some say that under current conditions, capitalism simply hovers over the earth, looking for a suitable place to land and invest until it is time to fly away again. As such, nation states are no longer the anchors for global capital, but rather function as transient and non-permanent landing pads. The question then becomes, how do we make ourselves attractive enough to entice this transcendental capital hovering above us so that it lands in our nation? The branding of New Zealand resources, labour and intellectual property have been key drivers of contemporary national culture. Both labour and national governments have pursued consistent and enduring strategies to attract global finance, to secure international audiences and to convince international workers and tourists that New Zealand is the place to be. Ghassan Haj has argued that national governments all over the world are transformed from being primarily the managers of a national society to being the managers of aesthetics of investment space. To survive this global condition, nation states need to offer up a point of difference on the global market that is almost the same but not quite. A little local inflection on more global cultural processes that can promise continued production as well as novelty and innovation. The second meaning of maiden Aotearoa refers to the dusky maiden stereotype and the ways in which Polynesian women have been framed as objects of desire and as access points to the appropriation of land and resources. Images of dark-haired, olive-skinned and passively sensuous native women are scattered throughout the Asia-Pacific region. They have the antecedents in 18th century Western art, popular culture, and the science traditions of the West, and they find their most current expression in global advertising, music videos, international art house cinema, and television. Mobile, flexible, endlessly alluring, the dusky maiden stereotype still haunts and helps ongoing articulations of the New Zealand nation and feeds into a larger investment in things Māori that might help the nation to appeal to a global audience, as well as provide comforting narratives of nationhood for the home crowd. How else did Whale Rider become a film described by a popular press as one that every New Zealander should see, if not for the dusky maiden dynamics underpinning Nikki Caro's creation? As I see it, Dusky maiden dynamics include the alluring, seductive, and aesthetically appealing dimensions of images of Pacific femininities and their mobile or flexible powers. Dusky maiden dynamics are useful for any nation state that needs to be responsive to global forces and flows that require newness and difference in what Haj calls an aesthetics of investment space. Dusky maiden characteristics of hospitality, Welcome and friendship are integral features of this next, next advertisement launched in the year 2000. Sorry about the quality. subjects to land in our nation, or at least to be carried by the national airline. 
I think that sometimes the banal nature of advertising offers up useful signs of a larger cultural complex and that we can read these images and ideas as a symptom of social forces that have a long and enduring history. The aesthetics of investment space that Harsh talks about in relation to globalisation has its roots in colonisation. And while this exhibit is focused on the nation state of Aotearoa, the dusky maiden stereotype has a longer and more transnational legacy that must be traced if we are really to get at the heart of the dynamics of the stereotype. According to Caroline Verco, the writings of Louis Antoine Bougainville in 1768 helped establish the Pacific as a timeless Arcadia that offered physical and spiritual relief to an increasingly industrialized West. Subsequent artistic, artistic, scientific and ethnographic activities pursued by Western subjects secured an imaginative geography of the Pacific as a place that was neither completely novel nor thoroughly familiar. The emergence of film technologies also played on the novel and exotic dimensions of Pacific cultures and it is not too extreme to say that from the late 1920s to the late 1960s, Hollywood was intoxicated with capturing romantic images of the South Seas on screen. And here I'm going to break away from my smooth presentation to show you a clip from Songs, Song of the Islands, 1942. The 1942 musical comedy, um, Song of the Islands, featured Betty Grable and Hilo Hattie, a Hawaiian singer, hula dancer, actress and comedian. In this following clip we, will we can see how the star persona of Betty Grable appropriates, reworks and reauthorizes the repertoires of Hawaiian femininities that are rightfully Hilo Hattis. It is this kind of playful violence which informs the Dusky Maiden legacy. So just excuse me for a second. Doesn't bring that up a little while. Oh, Louis Laird 
named his two-piece swimsuit the bikini as a celebration of the Allied efforts in World War II. In the same year and for the next 12 years, 23 nuclear tests were conducted in Bikini Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The schism between a fashion item that embraced an emerging trend for sunbathing and the real life effects on the population of Bikini and its surrounding environments is quite simply remarkable. It's like pointing to the fact that they're really constructed artificial images and you know the gap between the images and reality is just that much further apart. If this is a construction, I like it. aesthetic engagement to that of the exhausted aesthetic of irony within a neo-colonial context. 